Welcome to another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. In San Francisco, I'm Peter B. Collins. Today I'm joined by Richard Cahan. He is the former photo editor of the Chicago Sun-Times. And in recent years, together with Michael Williams, he has co-edited a series of books with very important uh, archived and historic photographs. And they all center around fairly troubling themes. I first talked to Rich when they published the book Un-American, photos of the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. In 2019, they published Aftershock, the Human Toll of War, with haunting World War II images that were taken by soldier photographers. And the latest publication is a powerful book called River of Blood, American Slavery from the People Who Lived It. Rich Cahan, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Peter, very much. You have done remarkable work here, as I say, uh, in some cases unearthing photos that uh, may have been lost uh, through history and as collections get shuffled from one place to the next and the people who knew the details of them uh, pass away or move away. And uh, so today we're talking about this powerful collection of photographs with quotations from the individuals. And these are people who were once slaves in the United States of America and uh, survived the emancipation and often lived uh, well into the 20th century. So tell us about where these uh, photos came from and the Works Projects Administration project from the uh, 1930s Depression that uh, produced the original images and the uh, uh, capturing of the quotes from the people who were photographed. Well, imagine for a moment a government that cares enough about people that they find it worthwhile to create a branch of government of uh, that would go out and interview 10,000 ordinary Americans and also interview 3,000 formerly enslaved African Americans. Uh, that was what the Works Progress Administration did in the 1930s. And we're focusing on a group of interviews that was done primarily in 1937 and 38 in mostly southern states, but they did get to about 25 states. And they literally, they, they knew that enslaved people were not going to be living much longer. This was 70 years after the end of the Civil War. And so they knocked on doors uh, the interviewers, and asked people about their experiences as slaves. And they created something called the Slave Narrative Collection, which is an incredible work on itself. But forgotten by many are the photographs that they took of over 300 formerly enslaved men and women. And what this book, River of Blood, is, it's a look at those photographs, those beautiful portraits with excerpts from the testimony that these men and women gave. And I think that the there's a great power when you combine words and pictures. And um, by, by reading the words, it, it's important. By looking at the pictures, it's important. But they're almost supercharged when you combine them together. Well, and Rich, just personally, uh, I got the book shortly after I had watched the currently released movie, Harriet, which is focused on Harriet Tubman, the Underground Railroad, and Cynthia uh, Erivo does an incredible job uh, portraying Harriet. And the movie is, uh, is gripping and graphic in many places, and we see the uh, true interaction of uh, slaves and the masters on a plantation, the urge to escape, the uh, perils that uh, were uh, visited upon people who did make that effort, and so this, I think, is such an important piece of American history, and uh, this brings to life uh, the people who survived the slave era. Tell us a little bit about the individuals who were sent out to locate these people and interview them. Well, they were somehow related to the humanities. Many of them were writers that used to work for newspapers. Remember, this is the Depression, and many newspapers uh, contracted. Uh, there were few books being produced. And so these were writers 
primarily who didn't have any other work. And so they contracted with the federal government sometimes for years. Uh, some great writers, uh, Nelson Algren, Richard Wright, worked for the Works Progress Administration. And um, they were curious. Uh, they were interesting. And um, it's amazing. Mo most, most were white. And um, they were viewed with suspicion by these people who you know, were former slaves. Uh, these people were living in shacks sometimes, and all of a sudden, a white man or a white woman knocks on their door and says that they're interested in their recollections of what slave life was like. Uh, you would think that they would be met with great suspicion, but um, people, uh, the elderly people who were interviewed were uh, precise. Uh, they, they talked eloquently. And then there was this moment for some of them that they actually had their photographs taken. And I think it came after, after reading the transcripts, it looks like the interviews were usually about an hour long. And then at the end, I, I presume um, the photographer says, do you mind if I take your picture? And they each struck kind of a beautiful pose. Uh, one woman uh, stood among her uh, flowing sheets that she was just doing in the, you know, that, that were drying outside the back of her lawn. Uh, Many people just kind of leaned back on their rocking chair on their porch. Uh, somebody was photographed in the middle of a field. A few people who had moved up north in Cincinnati, like Richard Toller, who's the uh, cover person on the book, uh, posed on a cobblestone street. And these pictures are so simple and real and authentic. They're not professional photographers. This isn't Dorothea Lang taking these pictures, but it's it's the, it's a snapshot portrait of what they look like. And there's you know, just like snapshots sometimes have more meaning than professional, you know, pictures. So you can imagine, I'm sure you, many listeners had their families photographed by professional photographers, but it's the little snapshots that have even greater meaning oftentimes in life. And that's what this book is based on. And do you know what kind of cameras they use? Did the government issue uh, brownies yeah. to... to uh... I, I think they were all using brownie cameras, which were the camera of the day. Um, their negatives are lost, just prints. And those prints were never really valued that much. Um, they're, you can tell that because they have little paper clips oftentimes on them sticking to the pages of the transcript. Um, and, but, but with today's technology, you can take these little snapshots and really look at them in a beautiful light. They're, they're, they're not printed huge. Uh, you have to kind of study them. But when you're studying them, there's so many little details of what they wore and their, what, what their houses look like and what their surroundings look like that they really elevate the words, <clears throat> excuse me, elevate the words in a beautiful manner. Go ahead and clear your throat. Yeah, I, I don't know if people would be that interested in the pictures on their own. I don't know if people would be that interested in the words on their own. But together, those words and pictures work together to create power. And Rich, these individuals hired by the government who went to, out to conduct these interviews, many of them captured the comments in the, the vernacular. And you went to great lengths to try to uh, uh, bring that to the book so that the, the reader does hear their voices uh, in a truly authentic way. That was one of our first challenges. Do we keep the vernacular or do we... You know, I'm putting quote marks up. Uh, do we translate them into what would be considered modern English? And um, the answer, obviously, was to keep keep the the words as they were transcribed, because a they're historical and they're uh, I'm not interpreting what they mean. But I fell in love with the language. This is the language of the rural South. Um, I think black and white. I don't think there's anything particularly, uh, you know. Uh, African-American ab about them. I, th I think whites in the rural so South in those years talked very similarly. And there's a great beauty to it. I remember being in high school and uh, reading Huckleberry Finn for the first time. And like all students, I said, oh, no, I, I don't understand that. I can't read this. And uh, my teacher, like most teachers, said, you have no choice. You just have to figure it out. And within days at that time, hours at the time, you know, I figured it out. And the same thing here. I think you figure it out after a a couple of passages. And if you don't, we've provided a, a glossary. But once you figure it out, you realize that there's a beauty to that language that um, that I'm so happy have, have, has not been lost. And Rich, one of the challenges you face, and I'm uh, dealing with it right here, right now, uh, 
trying to be uh, correct and uh, respectful. And there's often self-reference using the N-word. Yeah. And, and certainly uh, it was commonly used both in a derisive way and in just a, a, a labeling way. Uh, and uh, when an African-American person refers to him or herself using the N-word, uh, I certainly respect that. And I, I take no offense, and, and I'm certain most African-Americans wouldn't either. But there is the awkward situation that when white people even just quote verbatim uh, the actual statements that some of the people are quoted as making in the book, uh, it it doesn't play well. <laughs> I agree. Um, I think that the uh, we had no choice because we were faithful to the documents. But I think when you talk about when I talk about the book, uh, I'm not going to use that word. I don't think that's appropriate. Um, and um, uh, and I think that's OK. I think I, 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 if I said those words, I think that I would be calling more attention to the words than what's the words, the importance of what what's surrounding the words. And so so. It is in the book, and it was important. We had no choice in the book, but I think in, in discussions of it, I would I would leave it alone, personally. Sure. Yeah. Well, let me read here one that uh, doesn't uh, include any of those challenges. This is John M. Fields, who in the uh, little description, he was born into slavery 1848 in Owensboro, Kentucky, escaped in 1864, tried to join the Union Army, but was refused because uh, of his age. He then uh, moved to Lafayette, Indiana, and worked as a laborer and household servant, and he died in 1953. So uh, he, he lived more than 100 years, if his birth date uh, is accurate. And right. let me read his statement here. When I was six years old, all of his children were taken from my parents because my master died and his estate had to be settled. We slaves were divided by this method. Three dis disinterested persons were chosen to come to the plantation, and together they wrote the names of the different heirs on a few slips of paper. These were put in a hat and passed among us slaves. Each one took a slip, and the name on the slip was the new owner. I happened to draw the name of a relative of my master who was a widow. I can't describe the heartbreak and horror of that separation. I was only six years old, and it was the last time I ever saw my mother for longer than one night. And these brief but powerful descriptions really help us who never experienced slavery uh, or even the legacy of it get some sense of what kind of inhumanity was visited on these humans on a regular basis. I agree with you. I think one of the problems with our education is that we learn about slavery in kind of political terms. You know, we talk about Dred Scott, we talk about the North and the South. Uh, we learn about it in kind of economic terms. They talk about the, you know, the the cotton looms and uh, how the North sold, took the cotton and they depended on that too. And somehow the humanity, the single humanity, uh, human story seems to get lost. I think that's the greatest value of this collection, uh, for a long for a long time, you know, these people were interviewed in the 1930s, and I think I think people today forget that oral history was really looked down upon or considered suspicious by especially academicians uh, until really I'm a Chicagoan, so I think it's until Studs Terkel huh. really uh, you know brought it to elevated it to a height that. I think oral history is now sometimes more valued than written history. And so that's why this material has been so neglected for so many years. Well, I agree with you about Studs Terkel. And when I worked in Chicago in the 1970s, uh, I had another uh, a number of uh, encounters with him. And uh, it was always very pleasant and enjoyable. And his work, uh, I think, continues to provide valuable legacies, uh, again, in the spoken word, uh, which you know, is it's it has so many qualities that go beyond the kind of uh, stale historic writing uh, that does give you an accurate list of the facts and, uh, you know, people involved. But uh, little of the nuance uh, and, and personal interpretation. You know, I, I agree. You know, people talk a little bit about how the South 
pushed the plantation myth that African Americans were happy on, on plantations as slaves, that they were sheltered, that they were fed. And um, the histories of a century ago really depended on plantation records. And if you just looked at those records, it would paint a picture that is completely um, out of kilter, uh, it, you know, totally, totally false, because you, you would see how much was spent on clothes and food and things like that. Um, but the reality is what people really, how they were affected. And I was amazed that uh, the people that were interviewed for this project had such clear memories of those days. And, and obviously they should. Uh, as we get older, we our memories of the past sometimes become even clearer. And they were so willing to share that in, in great detail. Rich, one of the chilling quotes I'm about to read here refu refers to a human being as a chattel. And chattel is a kind of arcane legal term referring to property. Uh, and generally, it's insignificant property. It's like my grandmother's dresser or something like that. And this is a, a quote from Sarah Frances Shaw Graves. She was born into slavery in 1850 near Louisville. She and her mother were forcibly moved to Missouri to work for another slaveholder. Her father, never again seen by the family, was left behind in Kentucky. And she lived until 1942. Here's her quote. You see, there were slaves in those days, just like you got horse and mule and auto traders now. They bought and sold slaves and hired them out. Yes, rented them out. Allotted means something like hired out. But the slave never got no wages. That all went to the master. The man, was, uh, the man they were allotted to paid the master. I was never sold. My mama was sold only once, but she was hired out many times. Yes, uh, when a slave was allotted, somebody made a down payment and gave a mortgage for the rest, a chattel mortgage. Times don't change, just the merchandise. I love that last line. It shows how, even as children, these enslaved men and women knew what was happening. There's so many lines like that in the book, so many little moments of insight that um, almost every quote ends, 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 ends like that. Here's James Martin on a similar, uh, in a similar vein. We see others sold on the auction block. They're put in stalls like pens for cattle. There's a curtain, sometimes just a sheet in front of them, so the bidders can't see the stock too soon. The overseer is standing just outside with a big black snake whip and a pepper box pistol in his hand. When they pull the curtain up and the bidder crowd uh, crowds around, the overseer tells the age of the slaves and what they can do. One bidder takes a pair of white gloves they have and rubs his fingers over a man's teeth, and he says... You say this buck's 20 years old, but there's uh, cups worn to his teeth. He's 40 if he's a day. So they knock that buck down for $1,000 because they call the men bucks and the women wenches. Then the overseer makes them walk across the platform. He makes them hop. He makes them trot. He makes them jump. And, and Rich, this brings to mind the way Roger Ailes made his female anchors twirl in front of him. Uh, treating them as a, a kind of a wage slave, if you will. Uh, oh, but but this, this, this treatment is, is really chilling. And to see the way they were reduced to the level of, uh, of animal stock. I, I agree. And that's, um, the book has kind of, a, 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 it, it delves down into the deepest, darkest secrets of slavery, things like this, things about... Uh, uh, enslaved people put in dungeons and obviously whippings and things like that. But I think, and I hope you feel the same way, Peter, that the book ends up being a book about uh, resilience and beauty and uh, love of family. That, that That is a theme that never, you know, uh, the Civil War ends and, and people t tell, tell about how they went back to the South to find their mothers or their families, um, about how families were split up, but they kept sneaking back, you know, into plantations to be together. Um, uh, did you feel this way that it's, well, I, I'm interested in your response to the book and, and, and what struck you? Well, really it's the dignity of these former slaves who, you know, 
certainly survived and lived to see their freedom and to revel in that without forgetting uh, the depths of the indignities that they faced. And I also think that what comes through is the, the inner strength that was required to survive. Yes. And that, to me, is the intangible that, that really uh, comes through so strongly from the book. I, I agree with you. There's and there's there's lots of stories of that about seeing in the fields and determination to 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 just keep going. Um, Fanny Moore has a quote. Uh, she died in 1940, um, and she just talked about how all of a sudden her mother had this kind of um, revelation that she was going to be okay, and um, she started working harder and harder in the field in the plantation. Uh, owner, you know, questioned her like, "What's going on here? There's, there's something going on." And she said, uh, "I've been saved. The, the Lord has told me that I'll be saved." And, and uh, she said that uh, one day we will never be slaves. And of course, the plantation owner, hearing this, grabbed a, a, a cowhide and, and slashed her mother. Mother, but then it says she, this woman re- recalled, she just go back to the field to sing it. Just the strength. Well, and if I can connect it once again to this uh, new film, Harriet, uh, I don't want to spoil it for people, but there is a powerful scene where Harriet uh, uh, has the upper hand on her former master, and she could kill him. And instead, she chooses to uh, tell him that she's free in in simple terms. It's a more powerful and detailed scene than that. But uh, her, you know, at least the way that storyline is played in the movie uh, really plays up the deep spirituality and their sense of Christian forgiveness. I agree. Uh, Unfortunately, and you you learn this in the book, and I'm sure people know this very well, that freedom didn't really mean mean freedom for so many African-Americans. They, they, you know, the Civil War came to an end. They didn't know how to read. They didn't know how to write. They didn't know how to handle money. And, um, and so they were reduced oftentimes to actually working for the person who ran the plantation. Uh, I was reminded of a quote by Martin Luther King, who said after slavery that, that, that the years were freedom and famine at the same time. So the, the challenges of slavery just came to a different level. Understood. Uh, here's Wes Brady, born into slavery, 1849, on a plantation in Harrison County, Texas. Some white folks might want to put me back in slavery if I tell how we were used in slavery time, but you asked me for the truth. The overseer was astraddle his big horse at 3 o'clock in the morning, rousting the hands off to the field. He got them all lined up and then came back to the house for breakfast. The rows were a mile long, and no matter how much grass was in them, if you leave one sprig on your row, they beat you nearly to death. Lots of times they weighed cotton by candlelight. All the hands took dinner to the field in buckets, and the overseer gave them 15 minutes to get dinner. He'd start cuffing some of them over the head when it was time to stop eating and go back to work. He'd go to the house and eat his dinner, and then he'd come back and look in all the buckets. And if a piece of anything that was there when he left was eaten... He'd say you were losing time and had to be whipped. And then there's a graphic scene. He'd drive four stakes in the ground and tie a a man down and beat him till he's raw. Then he'd take a brick and grind it up in a powder and mix it with lard and put it all over him and roll him in a sheet. It would be two days or more before that man could work again. And so these are obviously very vivid recollections of Wes Brady. But as he relates them... Uh, they are compelling contemporary descriptions of what went on. Yeah, and I think it's important for people to understand that these descriptions aren't just randomly placed together, that we've we've combined them so that one, one person starts talking. It's almost as if it's a conversation. One person starts talking when the other person has stopped talking. Not that they're really in the same room, but they're all talking about, for example, the book starts talking about identity, and um, and 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 one person says uh, that that she doesn't know the year or the place where she was born, and the next person literally says he was given away as a child as a wedding gift by his slaveholder. Um, 
And, and, and then we talk about day-to-day -day life, or not we talk about, but then the enslaved men and women talk about day-to-day -day life. They talk about uh, violence. They talk about the end of the war and freedom, and they talk about looking back at those years of slavery. So it's not as if one person almost confirms what the other person says, and, and you really get a really human sense of what, what went on. And here's one more. Susan Merritt, uh, born into slavery 1850 in rural Texas. After freedom, she became a sharecropper with her parents in Harrison County. She then raised 15 children and died in 1938. And here's her quote. I hear about freedom in September, and they're picking cotton, and a white man rides up to Master's house on a big white horse, and the houseboy tells Master a man wants to see him, and he hollers, Light Stranger. It's a government man, and he has a big book and a bunch of papers. And he says, why hasn't the master turned these people loose? Master says he's trying to get the crop out. And he mm. tells master, have the slaves in. Uncle Stephen blows the cow horn, what they used to call to eat, and all of the blacks come running because that horn mean come to the big house quick. That man reads the paper telling us we're free. But master makes us work several months after that. He said we'll get 20 acres of land and a mule, but we didn't get it. Lots of blacks were killed after freedom because the slaves in Harrison County turned loose uh, right at freedom, and then in Rusk County they weren't. But they hear about it, and they run away to freedom in Harrison County, and their owners have them bushwhacked and shot down. You could see lots of blacks hanging in trees in Sabine Bottom right after freedom, because they catch them swimming across Sabine River and shoot them. They sure are going to be lots of souls crying against them in judgment. Wow. Yeah, it took, it took great courage to talk and to talk freely about these experiences. In fact, she, at first, she dem demurred and she said, I couldn't tell you how I was treated, she told the interviewer. And then all of a sudden she went on to recall, I think it was 10 or 20 pages in vivid detail, exactly, uh, what had happened, including the day that she was nearly beaten to death. Um, but I, I want readers, I, I, I hope that listeners uh, learn, and I hope you feel this way, Peter, that it's not so much, we, we haven't, it's not so much a book of horrors as a book of resilience and resistance. Uh, people talk about how they escaped. People talk about uh, so many things and, and, and their words, like the words that you've read, each one is very eloquent. Well, and and the thing that I don't find is any uh, any description of a broken spirit. Uh, they they certainly talk about the uh, humiliations and degradation that they endured, but I don't hear a sense of victimization. Uh, at least that's that's not what I picked up from any of the quotations. I agree with you, um, uh, Richard Toller, who is. Again, the person that we photograph, we use for our cover, simply said, I never had any good times until I was free. And he talks about he, he never went to school. He never learned to read. He never learned to write. He never could use money. Uh, we were never allowed no parties, he said. And um, uh, the eating was terrible. But he does it in a very um, uh, clear way. He, he, there's, no, there's no sign of hatred. Uh, it's just, you know, he's a man of about 90 years old, and he's going to continue on. No matter what happens, you, you can see in his eyes that he's going to just continue on. Well, Richard Cahan, thank you for joining us today. And uh, as we observe African American History Month uh, here in February, I hope that people will uh, buy your book, find it in a library, uh, and uh, turn the pages and uh, really let themselves uh, absorb the impact of the combination of the pictures and the words that you have so carefully uh, put together in this book. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate it. The book is available in bookstores. Uh, it's, it's also can be bought online, and people can go to our website, cityfilespress.com, and they can learn more about it or buy the book from us. But, uh, you know, libraries are a great resource, too. We, we just want this. We, we, we think that this is so important for America to see now. Once again, River of Blood, subtitled American Slavery from the People Who Lived It. Our thanks to Rich Cahan.
Thanks for listening to this conversation with photo editor Richard Cahan. Send your comments to peter at peterbcollins.com. And do what you can to support the investigative journalism work here at Who, What, Why. 